Mainstream entertainment. Bruce Lawn. The idea of socialism versus capitalism is at the front and center of the election. You have Trump saying, hey, listen, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are the radical left. They're going to drive the country into socialism, more or less. And you have folks on the other side saying, hey, we're going to slide into author authoritarianism uh, with the way he's using his executive power, so on and so forth. And then you got guys like Bernie Sanders who are further on the left and are pushing for a democratic socialism agenda. Um, what, does, what does that all mean? What does that all mean? Uh, I'm going to unpack it here for you guys in a second. I want you guys uh, to understand, in terms of capitalism, Valuetainment did a really good video today on what capitalism is. And I disagree with some of his stuff, but by and large, um, Patrick McDavid super dope. And he defined capitalism as having four things. The ability to sell, the freedom to sell, the freedom to buy, uh, the freedom to try, and the freedom to fail right? The freedom to sell, the freedom to buy, the freedom to try, and the freedom to fail. That's a pretty cool cool breakdown of, of capitalism. When I, when, I, when I talk about capitalism, I'm primarily talking about uh, free market ethical capitalism. Now, it was brought to my attention that a lot of these democratic socialistic nations like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, actually have some of the highest degrees of upward mobility, meaning that somebody can start at the bottom and work their way up. Now, the cons is obviously they pay more in taxes. I think the issue with democratic socialism or the idea of democratic socialism here in America is that Bernie Sanders, kind of the face of this whole movement, as well as AOC and the squad, are primarily talking about what? the billionaires and the millionaires, oh, the billionaires and the millionaires. And then, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders became a millionaire. He has three homes now. And all of a sudden, he's only talking about the billionaires, right, which is hilarious. And their whole Green New Deal, wanting to tax people who make over 10 million at 70%, so on and so forth. Uh, is there something to this? Is there something to the AOC plus three? Let me give you guys the bad news. Let me give you guys the bad news. Now, pull up some charts. Uh, and, and, and when we talk about wealth inequality, what we're talking about is the, the wealthiest people accumulating the most amount of wealth, right? The wealthiest people accumulating the most amount of wealth and the rich getting richer and the poor getting poor. This is a graph that should alarm you. By the way, the middle class shrinking is not good. Okay, so check this graph out. This is a graph, wealthiest Americans. Can you guys see that? Wealthiest America. Can I zoom in? Let me see if I can zoom in anymore. I lost it. Goodness gracious. Okay, here we go. That's better. Okay, the wealthiest Americans own an increasing share of wealth. Shares of wealth in the United States by wealth uh, percentiles. 1989 to 2016, okay? So here we have um, the, uh, the top 1% and look at their growth in wealth. They've, they've exceeded and they're, they've grown higher and higher. And then you have the next 9% and they've gone up and then they've gone down and then you have the bottom 90%, their accumulation of wealth has historically gone down, right? I'm gonna show you guys another chart. I'm gonna show you guys, so, so this is wealth creation. By the way, wealth, um, th depending on how you view wealth, I think, that, I think there's abundance and I think wealth can continue to grow even if there isn't, uh, if, if it's being attained more and concentrated more by wealthy people because they know how to, how money works. Wealth could be created. I believe wealth could be created. Some people don't. They believe there's finite resources. That's also a, de uh, a determination. Now, this is this chart. So this chart's not good, right? The 1% has outgrown everybody else and then the next nine percent is growing down and the 90 the bottom 90 percent are less likely to attain assets like land and homes now here's another chart this is the ratios of ceos to average worker pay the ratios of ceos to average worker pay um, and this is where I do believe that a guy like Thomas Sowell kind of gets it wrong in some of these topics, right? So you have here, um, the ratio to CEO pay was one to 25, okay, of the worker all through the 80s. And then as we passed more of these Reaganomics policies where you tax the rich less, you tax them less. Remember, they were paying 
70, 80 percent of taxes in the 50s and 60s, and then we started taxing them less. And, the, and I'm not saying it's connected, but there's there's definitely some correlation there um, that went up to now. The average worker it peaked, by the way, in the year 2000, where the average CEO made 375 times what the average uh, the average worker made. The average CEO made 375 times what the average worker made. And then it went down. This is this, what, what happened here. This is the recession after 9-11. Then it went up again to 350, the average. Okay, you guys, you guys follow me along on this chart? Then it went down again after the recession to 200. And now it's going back up and going down and so on and so forth. So that is not a good number. So you're talking about the, the richest people are earning the most amount and the poor the, the poor people are uh, are you know are, are down here. That's not good. That's that's wealth inequality, right? That's not good. And let's look at this chart. This is an interesting chart. Annual US income share of the top one percent so right now so this is where we started this is in the middle of the great right before the great depression right right in here it was 23 percent the one percent controlled 23 percent of the income one percent earned 23 percent of the income and it went down 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 we had true uh not true but but more equality where the top one percent only controlled 10 percent of the income the money the wealth generated Right, 1980. What happened in 1980? Ray, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. What did he do? He implemented right side economics, cut taxes for the rich, and and it'll quote unquote trickle down. Now, the thing I do agree with Thomas Sowell on is that he says like most people didn't believe that it was going to trickle down. Most Republicans didn't believe it was trickle down. Nevertheless, Reagan pushed these policies through in the 80s. And what happens from the 80s? It goes up and up. And up and up and we're back to where we were pre-Great Depression. We're back at 23%. The top 1% controlled 23% of all the revenue generated. The top uh, the top 1% controlled 23% of all the revenue generated. That's apparently it's gone down a little bit. What does that mean? That, 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 let me let me break it down to you this way. Accounted for inflation. Accounted for inflation. The average family in the 60s and 70s actually netted $10,000 more per year than they do today. The average family back in the 60s and 70s took home an extra 10,000. This is counting in 2020 dollars, okay? The average family took home more in the 60s and 70s than they do today. That's crazy, right? So, um and, and yes, by the way, the, the, just so you guys know, uh, I'm a business owner, okay? I, I, I do okay. I, I'm doing better and better by the grace of God. This stuff doesn't directly uh, impact me because when you're a business owner, which I highly recommend if you're entrepreneurial, start a business, right? You get taxed a little different because you get to write off business expenses directly against your revenue, which is good, meaning that somebody can gross hundred thousand dollars and can o and can only claim thirty thousand dollars because that's seventy thousand dollars in expenses right uh so you get taxed different you only get taxed on that thirty thousand at seventy thousand that's what it costs to run your business so just so you guys know for me um uh, I'm, I'm projecting to be in the top one percent earner sometime in the next 10 15 years of my life life lifetime uh by the grace of god we're talking five hundred thousand six hundred thousand seven hundred thousand that's about the top one percent of what the one you know top one percent make um so I'm sharing this stuff with you guys, those folks that are middle class, those folks that are going to you know, work a job, so on and so forth. Um, this stuff is important. Why is it important? Because if the middle class is shrinking and the poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting richer, this creates instability. Instability is not good for those of us who are trying to be wealthy and build wealth. And, 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 and it's, it, it becomes an in, imbalanced system. Now, this is what you got to understand about capitalism. Some degree of inequality is good. Hear me on this. Some degree of inequality is good. And this is from Economics Explained. Some degree of, economic, of income inequality is good. Why? Because it, it incentivizes people who are poor to develop skills, educate themselves, work harder to you know, move up their quality of life, to move up where, how much money they're making, so on and so forth. So some degree of inequality is good because you, want, you don't want 
everybody to just get everything, right? I don't, you shouldn't want me to get paid what LeBron James gets paid to play basketball. That's that's not what we want. So we want some degree of income inequality, but we don't want it so bad where people are just generationally poor inevitably. Hence, the presentation of democratic socialism. Now, this is what democratic socialism is taxed at. Just so you guys know, I'm gonna pull this up. This is how these taxes look. Okay, in America, okay, in America, tax to GDP ratio by tax revenue. Okay, tax to GDP ratio. Americans pay in the ballpark of 23% to GDP, right? Um, U.S. payroll taxes are defined as Social Security contributions in this graph, right? So this is all of our taxes. So we got what? Individual taxes. We got Social Security contributions. We got some corporate taxes generating this revenue. Um, property taxes. Consumption tax. This would be like our sales tax. Now check out Denmark. Okay, so one off top, their property, I mean, excuse me, their income taxes is way higher than ours, 24%. Uh, they're paying um 2.9 percent for property taxes corporate taxes but this number right here this is called a vat tax a consumption tax a value added tax okay denmark sweden which are capitalistic nations by the way go watch the documentary on youtube about uh, capitalism in sweden they're very capitalistic they went really socialist in the 70s and then turned it around they're paying upwards of 45 percent and I, I wonder where i think canada is kind of in the same ballpark right and the trade-off is quite simply hey listen 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 we're willing to trade off more of our taxes so for every hundred dollars we make we'll, we'll we're okay with on average giving up 40 40 dollars why well because we'll have Healthcare, so nobody ever has to file for bankruptcy if they have a terrible hospital bill. We have, um, you know, free college education, better education, uh, free school of choice, which Sweden does have, by the way. And they compete, private schools and public schools compete. We're willing to give up more. And what a lot of my Canadian friends say, hey, we're willing to give up more in exchange for more stability. And according to these nations, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, more upward mobility. But the reality is, we're paying for this, okay? We, we're paying, middle class is paying for this. Not just the billionaires and the millionaires, okay? Sweden's top tax rate, I believe, is 60%, okay? They're pushing forward with the Green New Deal, a 70% tax rate on people who make over $10 million, whether or not that's, you know, I, I think anything over 50% is pretty wild. But just to give you some context, right? Our highest income tax rate in America is 39%. Um, and Sweden's is in 60% for the highest income tax there. So just, just something to be thinking about that when these people are talking about it, democratic socialism, what are they actually talking about? Are they talking about North Korea? Are they talking about China? Are we going to become a communist nation? Is, 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 uh, we're talking about Venezuela. No, we're talking more lines of what's happening in Canada, more lines of what's happening in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, where you're going to have a form, a hybrid. By the way, we've had this. By the way, I, I grew up very poor. Guess who didn't pay to go to college? Me, right, until I took too long and I couldn't get done in four years. So then I went into student loan debt because I was an idiot. But I could have I could have went to college for free. I went like the first four years for free, right? So you you do have some people at the very, 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 very bottom that are getting free health care already and are getting free college already in America. The question is, do we want to pay do we want to go from paying on average 20, 25% in taxes to 40%, 45% in taxes? Or do we, for better, you know, medical health insurance, for better college, free college, or not? Or not? Um, I don't know. We got to debate that as a country. We got to debate that as a country. Value Tayman's point was, hey, we don't want to remove the opportunity for people to fail. Capitalism allows you to buy what you want, allows you to sell what you want, allows you to try to be anything you want to be. You want to be a real estate agent, you want to be a rapper, you want to be a YouTuber, you can try those things in a capitalistic nation and allows you to fail. His pushback will be a democratic socialist nation would create more safety nets, create more safety nets and won't allow people to fail. That's the con of this. The pro of this is what is more stability, more middle class, potentially more upward mobility. So you're not, you have a safety net, you know, hopefully less homelessness. I don't know. I don't know what the homelessness issue is like in the Scandinavian nations. So something to think about. This is something to think about. Now, 
Um, again, remember that, that, that the average family in the 60s and 70s netted $10,000 more. That's adjusted for inflation. That's something to think about. Um, and the question becomes, are we okay with this? I don't know. It depends, right? It, it really does depend on where you're at on this uh, this spectrum when it comes to socialism, capitalism. We've had a hybrid here for a long time in America. If we're just going to be transparent, we've had both capitalism and socialism here uh, for a while. So, do we want to go down the route of the Scandinavian countries, or do we not want to have the 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 safety nets? How does this get funded? This is the question. How? does this get funded? A lot of countries who are socialistic or, or went down that road usually have some degree of natural resource and they write people a check to fund their welfare system. Venezuela went wrong in this. They really did it wrong. Sweden, Denmark, Norway, they're doing a, be a better job of it. So the natural resources of the country, the country's GDP, and granted, these are way smaller countries, by the way, Scandinavian countries, are able to fund social programs and social safety nets. Where does our natural resources come from? Remember, we're a consumer nation. Where does that come from? And I'm going to start talking much like one of my political heroes here in a second. In America, we do have some oil. And by the way, in places like Alaska, they have a big social program. They, I believe, the average, the the an Alaskan resident gets five thousand a year from the state of Alaska for their oil. Okay, that is a social program. They get that as a dividend, right? Venezuela did the same thing. Then they screwed it all up. In America, what is our natural resource? Tech and data, automation. And our data, your data, my data is being sold all the time. The fact that you're using Facebook, YouTube, Google, they're tracking you and it allows businesses to sell to you. That is our, that is our natural resources, data and tech and innovation. So how do we fund it? Same way, we would fund a value added tax, a consumption tax, so co companies like Amazon couldn't get out of paying it or paying their quote unquote, fair share of corporate taxes, not overcounting too many deductions. And so it becomes a value added tax and we take that value added tax from every Amazon transaction, from every Apple transaction, and we take that and we fund these programs. Now, I think the federal government is wildly inefficient, in my opinion, I think it's too big. And I don't think it does a good job of managing what it already has. And so that is why, that is why I supported Andrew Yang, because it was literally the best of both worlds. We can pull from the Scandinavian countries. We know what our natural resources are. However, instead of, instead of giving people free health care or free education, maybe we should give people the money directly and let them decide what they're gonna do with it. So if you are 20 years old, 18 years old, fresh out of high school, you can go to college, or if you're getting $1,000 a month in this American dividend, freedom dividend, UBI, you can start your business, right? You can move in with some other people, start your business. This is not a liberal or conservative uh, philosophy, by the way. There's there's uh, libertarian conserv fiscal conservatives that believe in this. And the caveat would be that the folks that get the thousand dollars a month would then have to either opt into this or they would stay if they have social security or if they have disability or if they have welfare, stay on that. The issue with those programs is those programs, you have to prove that you're looking for employment. You have to prove that you're disabled. Whereas here's, hey man, here's a thousand bucks a month. No questions asked. The theory being more people would move away from their social security and the disability and just take the thousand dollars a month, maybe go get a roommate, maybe live with some family. And at least there's less people who are poor and less people on the streets, right? And so what we don't, what we don't wanna do what we don't want to do is uh, enable uh, and, and mediocrity, but we also don't want to punish mediocrity. The average person is just, they're going to be average. But we also don't want to punish greatness because when you don't punish the, well, if, you, if you punish the smartest and the most creative and the most technologically advanced, you, you desensitize them for making dope stuff, for making amazing, valuable technology that benefits the world as a whole. I say all that to say, ladies and gentlemen, capitalism versus socialism, it's a dead debate. That We've been a hybrid. The question is, 
which direction do we want to go? Do we want to go the Scandinavian model or do we want to go, do we want to stay kind of where we are? The issue with kind of where we are is we have crony capitalism. What is crony capitalism? It's when the government steps in and provides welfare to corporations like it did in 2001 after 9-11 because of what? Those plane crashes took down the entire airline industry for a while. Uh, Right. We bailed those out in 2008. We bailed out banks. Right. And, and this year we bailed out companies. So what happens? People are bailed banks and big corporations. Too, they're too big to fail. Have you heard this before? They're too big to fail. So we bailed them out. Right. Crony capital. It's kind of our current system. Right. Whereas like, hey, if every person had a thousand dollars a month or whatever that number is, if every person had a thousand dollars a month. Well, then you know what? At least they won't starve. Right. At least where does that money come from? It comes from VAT tax. It comes from every Amazon transaction, every Apple transaction and, and our data being sold. Something to think about. Something to think about. This to me makes the most sense when it comes to the capitalism, socialism debate, because we do have abundant resource here in America. We do. We do. But we are a consumer economy. We're consumers. Right. So those are some of my thoughts on this whole capitalism versus socialism debate. Andrew Yang. Um, value tainment. Hopefully this was helpful. And you guys got to decide. Don't let the Bernies and the AOCs, if, the, if you're a democratic socialist or you lean left, you're progressive, whatever, just don't let them trick you into thinking that only billionaires and millionaires are going to fund free health care and free education. No, 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 no. Me and you are going to fund it. The average taxpayer is going to fund it. Our taxes are going to go up. They are. And maybe when we get better health care and we don't have to pay for health care and then we, 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 we pay more in taxes, but we get more services, maybe some of us would be cool like, like our brothers in Canada are. Uh, maybe we won't. I don't know. I don't know. I, don't I tend not to have a lot of faith in the government to be efficient and effective at doing stuff. I think it's too big. I think it's too fat. I do like the idea of like, hey, man, cut back some of these welfare programs, give people the money directly, let them decide what they want to do. All of this started making sense after COVID, when the government shut everything down to protect and create safety. And then they're like, what do you mean? And my business is shut down. I just lost my business. I just lost my job. What are you supposed to do? Then all of a sudden, the ideas of sending people regular checks from conservatives like Mitt Romney started to make sense. And Andrew Yang has been saying this for a couple of years now. Just something to think about. Hopefully that was helpful. Let me know what you guys think. Kingstream Entertainment. Bruce Lawn.